Good evening Packers. Tonight I will be reading chapter 1 from my novel The Mortal and the Entity. Chapter 1 The Plan Since it was a recurring dream, even when the attacking dogs were at the most ferocious, Evan was aware that he was inside a nightmare. The ringing doorbell was a welcome interruption to the canine attack that occasionally found its way into his dream state. Evan's canine phobia only entered his world when he was asleep, but when he was awake he rather liked dogs. Let's put it this way, he thought. No dogs have ever disturbed my sleep at half past one in the morning, ringing my doorbell and banging on my door. As a smile appeared on his face, a thought passed through his mind. What if it's the police? The smile left quicker than it had arrived. He peeped through a hole in the top off of the door caused by the departure of a small knot, which had long since taken it upon itself to run away back to the forest, rather than spend the rest of its existence in a door that belonged to someone it didn't even know. At least that's the type of anecdote that Evan liked to tell people when he was feeling like the devil's advocate, so as to alter the direction of a tedious conversation. He was unable to make out who was at his door as they were standing too close to the peephole. Still, the finger of stubbornness relentlessly pressed the doorbell. Move back so I can see who it is, he whispered to himself in a barely audible voice, fearful he may alert the visitor to his own presence. No sooner had the whispered words left his lips when the ringing ceased, and as though obeying the almost silent command, the doorbell ringing visitor stepped back. Evan's heart sank when he saw it was that had been annoyingly pressing his doorbell. He entertained the notion that an early morning wake-up call from the police may have been a more agreeable manifestation than a visit from the two scallywags that were congregating on his doorstep now. He considered creeping back upstairs and ignoring the unwelcome disturbers. But as he turned away, the door knocking turned into banging, and so for the sake of the neighbours, he resigned himself to unlocking his door. What? he snapped abruptly, almost before he had opened it. We need a favour, the taller of the two told Evan, stepping uninvited into the hallway. Hide that for a week or so he continued, pointing towards a conspicuously parked car. The car was illuminated by the orange glow of a street light and had one wheel humped up on the pavement. Keep it in your garage until Saturday night, added the other stockier man. Evan felt as though it sounded more like an order than a request. And as it was accompanied by an intimidating stare, his assumption was probably correct. Having mentally rehearsed his reply, he opened his mouth to let forth his words of refusal. But instead of the words he had planned to say, some other words took it upon themselves to jump to the front of the talking queue and came tumbling out. It was as if they had a will of their own which seemed to be the case whenever he got the intense stare from the persuasive one of the two. Evan viewed the mean-looking man as a modern-day gangster, with a chip on one of his wide shoulders that nobody had ever managed to knock off. The words of refusal, then, remained silent, and words of agreement and acceptance came forth to take their place. 
With the deal for the storage of the car agreed, the two visitors left, and with the car safely garaged away, Evan returned to his bed. Although warm when he had left to answer the door, it was now as cold as when he had first retired two hours earlier. As he lay there, he cast his mind to an article that he had read earlier that day in a colour supplement magazine. It concerned microscopic bed mites. Millions of them, he thought to himself. Millions of the little parasites sharing my bed and not one of them had the foresight or the decency to keep it warm. He smiled to himself and his cheeks rose to accommodate the expansion of his lips. A brief smile. Then his face relaxed. His body warmed and his mind wandered. His logical, conscious thoughts were replaced by irrational visions. Visions of an army of bed mites clothed in woollen hats and fur mittens, each one carrying a tiny hot water bottle in an attempt to make amends for their previous thoughtlessness and keep his bed forever warm. He was, of course, dreaming, but this time no nightmare came to haunt him and no dogs came to hurt him. It transpired in the course of the following week that the car had been acquired as a means of transport to the old manor house. The idea was to relieve the occupants of some of their excess silverware, which the men considered too much of a burden for the elders of couple to have to constantly polish and care for. Very considerate, thought Evan, who was by now an accomplice in a forthcoming job. He was not at all happy with either the arrangements or the location of the night's work that lay ahead, and I spent the last two half pints of beer proposing his alternative plan. My idea is a good idea. It's simple and it's safe because there's nobody there. So if by any chance we do get caught, it's a straightforward robbery charge with no extra time added on for hurting people. Evan cast his glance in the direction of the one with the cold hard stare and then continued. Besides, we know exactly what we will be getting from the warehouse. Up at the manor house, the hall's far too ambiguous to warrant the risks involved. And what? asked one. Ambiguous. It means unclear, replied the tall one, lifting his glass from the table. A little bit like his beer. He then smiled at his clever comparison. Why didn't he say unclear then, if that's what he meant, instead of am, um, whatever it was? He can't help himself, assured the tall one. He sometimes gets dictionaryitis, at which they both laughed more than Evan felt was warranted. Evan waited for the laughter to die down and then continued with his alternative plan. Com computer chips and the like are what we should go after, circuit boards and central processing units. They are small, easy to carry and even easier to get rid of if you know the right person. Evan showed him a copy of the previous night's newspaper, which was carrying an advertisement for a night watchman at the said warehouse, which surely meant that there was no security guard at the warehouse this weekend. That factor tipped the argument completely in his favour, and they all elected to go with Evan's plan. Evan felt pleased that he had persuaded his companions to change venues, as the idea of stealing from old people made him feel like a bum. Besides, there were at least two dogs up at the manor house. After his recent nightmare, the very thought that the canine demons could become a reality filled Evan with a deep, inexplicable fear. 
I know I'm being stupid, he consoled himself, but that last dream was so vivid, it proper shook me up. Thankfully, the recollection of the canine violence was interrupted by his accomplices, who were now hitting out the rhythm of some music that was playing from the jukebox. One of them was tapping his beer glass with a coin, while the other one patted out the bass beat with the now rolled up newspaper against the palm of his hand. When the eight bar riff got to the final beat, he would finish off on the head of the glass tapper. Evan could not help but think to himself what a hollow sound the head seemed to make when wrapped with the newspaper. Being only momentarily amused by the antics of the two musicians, Evan's eyes scanned the room in search of a more original and intellectual form of entertainment. He looked across the room at a shaft of sunlight that streamed in from a window. Evan watched dozens of dust particles dancing in the smoke, jitterbugging to the music, each one wearing a tiny dust jacket and matching trousers. Again, Evan found himself daydreaming, as a way of escaping from boring people that he did not really like, whose intellect seemed to be on a level with that of the dust particles. As the song on a jukebox came to an end, the carriage glided across its mechanism, bringing Evan's daydreaming to an end. His eyes continued their search for the elusive alternative entertainment, and they focused upon the face of a solitary drinker, who seemed to be unaware of Evan's attention. The lone patron seemed comfortable with his own company, and at ease with himself, peaceful with his thoughts. He seemed only out of place in this establishment where he had found himself. His clothes didn't seem to fit in here either, and perhaps belonged on a model in a fashion boutique, thought Evan. The garment that the unfamiliar person wore was large and loose. It gave no indication as to his size or shape. Made from cloth that was neither pure silk nor pure satin, but a mixture of both, its colour seemed to shimmer and fluctuate between a coppery brown and a rustic red. As Evan was examining the garment further, he realised that the wearer had noted his scrutiny, so he looked away, fearing he may cause offence, unwanted t attention, or worse still, a confrontation. The afternoon was moving on and people were beginning to vacate the premises. Evan had finished his drink and was himself ready for leaving. Looking around, he noticed that even the solitary drinker had quietly slipped away. Only a circle of wetness on the polished tabletop remained as an indication that he had ever been there at all. Evan stood up as he was in need of the smallest room in the pub. He walked across the tap room and through the appropriately marked door. For a pub of such a size it was indeed a small room, containing only two urinals, one cubicle, a sink, a hand dryer and a small wall mirror which was cracked. Thankfully for him, the room was empty, for he seemed to find great difficulty in using a new rhino if another one was being attended next to him. Having relieved himself of the afternoon's liquid refreshments, he started to fasten himself back up. It was at that moment he became aware of the presence of another person in the room. He was a solitary drinker, and the unexpected appearance of him made Evan jump and hiss the words, Jesus. 
He felt anxious, wondering how on earth someone had managed to sneak into the room without even squeaking the door. Evan turned and looked him straight in the eyes. Kind eyes they were though, without a trace of malice. Evan relaxed as he felt he was in no danger, but was still baffled by the sniper style evasiveness that the new arrival had used to get the drop on him. I've been watching you for some time now, the stranger confessed to Evan, who was beginning to wonder just what was going on. And I need to talk to you, he told him. Just then, the door creaked, and Evan turned towards it to see the tall one of his two friends standing half in and half out of the room. Ah, oh, there you are, he said to Evan, scanning the washroom, left to right, and then back again. Good. Nobody here. He lowered his voice anyway. We're going now, so pick us up as agreed. Seven o'clock, yeah? Uh, responded Evan, glancing around and finding himself astounded that the room was indeed empty. He faltered in his response. Seven? Is that what we said? Seven it is then. With that, the tall one left, wondering why Evan appeared to be so vacant. The fact that the room was unoccupied had left Evan's mind confused and as empty as the room itself. Alone was exactly what he was, for there was only one cubicle in which to hide, and with the door being open, he could see that there was nobody in there. It was as empty as his list of explanations how to how the Houdini toilet attendant had made good his escape. Evan's mind became a void, a wilderness, where no thoughts wanted to materialise for fear of being ridiculed. Gradually, words, ideas and part notions began to assemble in order to assist Evan with an explanation. Nothing seemed to be helping him confront the fact that somehow someone had walked through, no, disappeared in front of, of my eyes. Yes, that's it. That's what happened. You know where? Absolutely not. And yet where's he gone? How did he manage to materialise in here in the first place? Thoughts now dashed through the corridors of his mind in a spiderous frenzy, none of them possessing any logic or reason. They blamed the beer, they accused drugs, to which Evan quickly pointed out that this particular vice held no appeal to him whatsoever. Maybe one of your friends has quietly slipped something into a drink for their own amusement, suggested his thoughts. Don't be stupid. We are working tonight. Why would either of them do that? He rallied back at the incredulous suggestion. Just trying to help, his mind assured him. It must be the beer, he tried to fool himself with the suggestion that he had had one too many drinks. Nonsense, he said out loud, knowing that two hearts of lager and a sip of lemonade did not make a cocktail of hallucinations. Pausing for a moment before he left the room, half expecting the stranger to, pe to appear again, perhaps out of thin air. Evan looked into the wall mirror at himself, feeling a little freaked out. The crack in the mirror distorted his image and he felt it appropriate that his mind and face now reflected the same representation. He took one last look into the empty cubicle and then he turned and left, 
wondering whether to mention the incident to anybody. On the short walk home, Evan was dividing his thoughts between the night's work that lay ahead and the stranger from the pub. He was trying to concentrate on how many computer components would fit into the boot of the car, how much they would be worth and what he would do with his share of the proceeds. His thoughts were constantly interrupted with visions of the unknown man and how he had managed to evaporate. Evan's logic was trying to dispute the evidence that his physical senses knew to be true. Of course he was there, I saw him with my own eyes, he told himself. But if he was there, where did he go? Evan searched his mind for some clarification. I wonder if I'm not well, he suggested to himself. This seemed like a reasonable explanation. But as soon as the idea had presented itself to Evan, he had to dismiss it, realising that if he was so ill, his imagination had made an, appari an apparition appear and speak to him. Then he was not in a fit state to work that evening. As he continued walking, he continued talking out loud, virtually having an argument with himself. So he was there, but really he wasn't. Then he disappeared into thin air or managed to walk through a solid wall. And even though I'd never seen him before, he knew me and he wanted to talk to me. He tried to put his thoughts on hold for a moment and he changed the gears of his mind into neutral as he felt that it was driving him around the bend. It was all too much for a Saturday afternoon but his agitated mind soon grew restless and pushed on with the inquisition as to the identity and the escapology abilities of the stranger from the pub. I wonder if it really was me that he wanted to talk to, he asked, subconsciously altering the line of questioning, from the impossible physics of walking through stone walls to the mathematical probabilities of mistaken identity. I wonder if he got me mixed up with somebody else. That's probably it. After all, I'd remember him if I'd met him before. He was a bit of a... How can I put this without being mean? Weird, oh, yes, definitely weird. This, di this still did not solve the problem of the disappearing act, but at least it allowed him to push it to one side for a while and attack it later. Perhaps when he had rested and regrouped. He stopped walking as though this would help him gather his thoughts and sort them out in, into some kind of helpful order. Mixed up with somebody else? I think not, he said, as he gently stroked his chin in a manner that suggested he thought he was far too good looking to be mistaken for anybody else. He faked a smile at the false vanity that he had used to offset the uneasy feeling lurking at the back of his mind, poised to push their way to the front at the moment that he left his concentration wane. He set off walking again, much faster than his usual pace, as though attempting to keep the foreboding questions behind him. As he reached his house and approached his front door, he decided that the best thing to do, well the easiest anyway, was to postpone any more thoughts of his early encounter with the stranger, until either he saw him again, or the night's work was done. That way his concentration would be keen and focused while he was at work. With that decision reached, he retired to bed for two hours, for tonight would be a long and busy night. 
Much busier than ever was expecting. Tonight was a night that would turn his world upside down. A night that would be filled with demons. Some which wanted to help him and others that were determined to hinder him. As he slept in the, in the late afternoon, he could not have dreamt what lay ahead and what the stranger from the pub wanted, nor what all the others had in store for him. Join me on Saturday as I read chapter two of The Mortal and the Entity on YouTube. If you enjoy our videos, please like, share and subscribe to our pages. If you would prefer to read the written version, rather than listening to me narrating the story, then please look it up on our Facebook page. Thank you Packers, and I shall see you Saturday.